I'm Derek Wilding. I'm the co-director of the Centre for Media Transition at University of Technology, Sydney. I'm talking today to Dr. Karen Lee, who's currently with the School of Law at University of New England, but will be joining us here in the Faculty of Law at UTS in 2019. Karen's just released a new book called The Legitimacy and Responsiveness of Industry Rulemaking. And we're speaking about that today, and I'm going to ask her about some of the conditions around self-regulation. Uh, before we get to a question like the effectiveness of, of self-regulation, Karen, I'd like you to just outline for us um, why self-regulation might be used and why it's thought that in some circumstances the benefits of self-regulation uh, might outweigh those of more formal regulation. Okay. Um, well, self-regulation really emerges in response to the failures of command and control. So, so for example, industry rulemaking, um, which is a, a component of self-regulation, um, really was seen to be a way um, to overcome s some of these weaknesses, which were things like um, overly prescri prescriptive rules, um, detailed rules that became very costly for industry to comply with, um, uh, we also saw, um, you also saw instances of um, rules that were completely unreasonable. Um, and you also saw um, a lot of what was referred to as creative compliance, whereby industry um, actually re was really kind of engaged in a game whereby it was trying to circumvent the rules because of their complexity of the rules rather than actually comply with the underlying spirit of the mm -hmm. or per underlying purpose of the rules. Um, so self-regulation really kind of emerges and kind of in response to that. And in industry rulemaking specifically is seen to have a number of advantages um, by regulatory scholars because it, it, it provides a way to harness the skills and talents of um, the, the regulatory um, it, it, of, the, of the specific industry bodies um, and, it, and as a result of harnessing those skills it's a way of kind of mitigating um, um, over prescription it, res, it is said to result in rules that are more reasonable more innovative more timely um, certainly more efficient um, and it is also um, really it would it allows for rules that are better targeted to the very industry sectors which are affected by those rules, um, and certainly the, the the rationale is that well, if rules are better targeted, um, it's more likely that their industry will actually comply with those rules, um, and and really kind of the I suppose the the, the real. Um, justification for, for self-regulation industry rulemaking as well. If industry is more likely to kind of bring about um, the achievement of social social goals, um, right. so things like um, you know uh, and increasing um, you know the long-term benefit for end users, mm -hmm. um, th things of that nature. Okay. All right. So um, based on your research, what do you think are some of the principles that, that might mark the, the legitimacy of this form of rulemaking? Um, well, I argue quite strongly in the book that uh, industry rulemaking needs to be tied um, and the frameworks need to be tied explicitly to the un underlying rule of law um, ob objectives. Um, and in particular, the procedural and institutional principles that underpin the rule of law. So here I'm talking about things like transparency, uh, deliberation, impartiality, and the notion of accountability. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so um, tell us about your own research in the, in the telecommunications sector. Um, we'll come to your findings in a moment, but um, what, what did you actually do in relation to, to the telecom sector? Sure, um, well, um, I undertook um, three historical case studies um, of industry rulemaking. Um, I was looking at the Communications Alliance, which is seen as the peak mm -hmm. uh, self-regulatory body in the Australian telecommunications sector. Um, uh, certainly, um, researching in, in, in the area of industry rulemaking can be quite a complex process, primarily because the industry rulemaking exercises tend to be confidential. Um, um, so in this particular instance, uh, I was not permitted to um, directly observe working committee processes that were ongoing, um, but the Communications Alliance was um, supportive of the research project and uh, gave me access to all of the internal documentation that they had generated and retained. 
Um, and I, um, so re that included things like minute, um, minutes of meetings, mm -hmm. um, agenda, uh, paper, uh, supplementary papers that were provided by parties. Uh, and I supplemented that information by undertaking um, some face-to-face -face interviews with um, individuals who'd actually sat on these working committees and actually participated in the rulemaking exercises. Um, so, uh, but that um, uh, was quite a difficult process um, because certainly I was looking at codes of practice that were no longer in force and that was done deliberately um, because, of, because industry rulemaking is seen as a particularly contentious area. And I, I wanted to give um, interviewees an opportunity um, to have some space whereby they could talk feel feel they could talk more freely about the process mm -hmm. because um, certainly if you uh, before I started the research um, it was very much a he said she said type of debate um, that one saw in in both newspapers and some of the academic journals. Okay, all right. So so based on that um, review of the evidence which hadn't been done before. For this sector, what do you think um, are some of the factors that might be considered if you're planning for effective self-regulation in, in communications? Okay. Well, there are, there are a number of factors and they're, they're interrelated and um, it's difficult from the research to identify any one particular mm -hmm. factor as, as, um, as kind of the, the, the one factor that is going to result in legitimacy. So it is, an, it is a complex exercise. Um, but some of the factors that I look, um, decided, um, I think industry structure is a very important one. I suggest in the book that uh, industries that are comprised of, say, a smaller number of larger entities rather than a, uh, having a multiplicity of participants would be more suitable for um, industry rulemaking exercises. I also talk about um, the fact um, there needs to be some history of um, or a kind of working relationship between industry regulators uh, and uh, consumer and public interest organizations. I think that's quite important. Um, other factors included uh, the, the nature of the participants, um, particularly from on the corporate side. I argue that they need to be fairly senior or um, individuals within the corporations um, for two reasons. One being that they need to be able to identify the participants um, that are able to, uh, within the organization, that have some kind of stake in the rulemaking exercise, um, but but also they need their role when they serve on these on these working committees is to actually commence and sustain a, an internal dialogue within those corporation within those commercial divisions, and and really that that's important because self reflection. Um, is, is essential, I think, to the success of industry rulemaking exercises. Uh, other, other factors I think are important um, include um, have regulators having a big stick, what's referred to as a big stick. Um, so they really need powers to step in where rulemaking exercises are failing. And ASIC, which um, has received a lot of public attention, um, that's one of the bodies responsible for, that oversees the banking sector. Um, that, uh, and, and there have been a number of criticisms surrounding the weaknesses of the, of the banking code. Um, but in, the, in that particular sector, uh, ASIC had no power to step in and address weaknesses. And I think that's, that's particularly important. Um, but having those powers, of course, isn't, isn't necessarily going to be sufficient. You do need regulators who are willing to um, exercise that power. Another significant factor, I, I believe, is uh, having consumer and public interest organizations sit directly on working committees. Uh, and I think they serve three important functions, um, one being um, that they challenge industry. Mm -hmm. um, and so while, um, while I'm, I'm certainly not advocating that consumer uh, and public interest organizations somehow represent the consumer and public interest, they do serve a very important function by actually asking questions of industry mm -hmm. and forcing them to justify their position. They also um, serve an important function um, in actually keeping regulators and ministers honest um, in this process um, to avoid some of the, um, I suppose, kind of collusion, uh, perhaps collusion is too strong a term, but some of the um, capture that um, it can be seen as, a, has, has been seen as a criticism in this area. And then the other important function that they serve is that um, they actually bring 
industry to the negotiating table. Um, and one of the case studies I looked at, that's uh, um, there was a very clear instance where industry really wasn't wasn't willing to participate um, and was wasn't very well engaged with the process. And of course, what happened was that consumer and public interest groups stepped in, drafted rules that were very strong, mm -hmm. uh, and that of course drew um, industry pr um, out of the woodwork uh, as soon as those draft rules were released into the public domain. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, Karen, thanks very much for that. That's a great introduction to your research. Um, and thank you for listening. The Legitimacy and Responsiveness of Industry Rulemaking is published internationally by heart and we'll provide a link to it.